I've been using this, the Samsung Galaxy Fold now for a month. And I'm here to share with you my thoughts about some of the best features about it and possibly some of the worst. But then I'm gonna tell you the truth about the Samsung Galaxy Fold 2. Welcome back to another episode of Stu's Reviews. After using the Fold 2 for a month, I've realized there's a lot of things that I love about it. And there's also a few things that I don't love about it. But I wanna share with you my personal experience and some of the things that I've used and found out about the device that is both for and against spending an inhumane amount of money purchasing it. As a footnote and a bit of an introduction to the level of usage that I've gotten out of this, I know a lot of people have been quite shy with their devices, keeping it in hermetically sealed boxes inside their studios and only reviewing it from inside there. Well, I haven't in typical Stu's Reviews fashion. I've even taken it hiking and camping in Scotland for a week, so this thing has been put through its paces. And I wanna show you today how it's performed. So let's take a look at the specs. This is the Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 2 5G, which really should be simply called the Samsung Fold 2. But either way, it's a fantastic looking device. Although it does have an AMOLED display on the front, I wanna skim over that for now and come back to it later on. So let's move on to the cream of the crop, the folding screen. This thing is incredible, and unlike the original Fold, this actually uses glass in its five layers for the screen's construction using a 0.0012 inch ultra thin layer of glass. This display can also run an adaptive 120 hertz, which is buttery smooth. This is all powered by the Snapdragon 865 Plus with 12 gigabytes of RAM and an internal storage of 256 gigabytes. Its cameras are a little bit down on the specs compared to other flagship devices at 12 megapixels across the board, but this doesn't stop it from being a surprisingly good camera, which you'll see later in the episode. It's such an impressive device to look at, so let's get stuck in and let me share with you how this wondrous piece of tech has performed. So let's get the title feature out of the way. It folds. It folds. It folds. It folds. Did I did I mention? It folds. It folds. Look at this. It actually folds. It folds. This is a folding device. It has a folding screen. This cannot be understated. Yes, it's called the Fold 2, but this is the first folding device that I've ever tried. And the fact that this thing folds, it folds, F folds, this thing folds. I think we've become desensitized to technology. I mean, let me put it this way, smartwatches, right? These have got OLED displays in them, they're tiny, you'll get weeks out of the battery life, and there's more trackers in here than the government have in your smart speaker. But 10 years ago, smartwatches weren't even really a thing, and anything that was around at that point was bulky and really poorly made and horrible nasty screens. Overall, the technology has come from nowhere and is now commonplace on everyone's wrist. So when do we stop becoming in awe of this type of technology? For me, the Fold reignites that feeling of awe about tech and, you know, what is this? Because look at it. I don't know if I mentioned, but this thing folds. That is it's just incredible. I can't tell you how incredible that is. Samsung have really executed it really well in the Fold 2 as well. Although there's a visible crease down the center, it's minimal. And with the screen on higher brightness head on, it's hardly even noticeable. Admittedly, when you look at it from the side, it's a bit more noticeable, but why would you be looking at your phone side on? but it really is a fantastic display and it's been super useful to be able to open it up, unfold it and view things like maps whilst out hiking because it means that you can see a greater area that you're looking at rather than having to pinch and swipe and zoom on a smaller screen. So that has been absolutely invaluable. 
the refresh rate to boot as well is 120 hertz. So that just makes everything really fluid, really snappy. And I honestly cannot sing the praise enough of this display. It is super, super impressive. I mean, look, I know some people won't like that crease in the middle, and I get it, I completely get it. But trust me, when you're looking at this display head on with the screen on a higher brightness, like I've already said, it is hardly noticeable. You can feel it with your finger when you run your finger over the screen, but again, it's not that bad. The only thing I don't like about this screen is the screen protector, and that's because it makes it feel a little bit tacky, a little bit rubbery, and it picks up fingerprints like you wouldn't believe. Now, Samsung say that you can get this screen protector removed and replaced. They don't recommend it, but there are YouTubers out there that have dared to remove their screen protectors from the display and apparently it feels much nicer and much more like glass when you do but that's too ballsy for my blood i won't be doing that anytime soon and the screen protector is staying firmly where it is because this is an expensive phone and we'll get onto that in a bit Interestingly, that fact is slightly different from the Fold 1 because the screen protector on that was definitely not removable in any way, shape or form. In fact, if you removed it, it would just destroy the phone entirely. So the fact they've allowed or made it so that you can take that layer off if you dare, even though you shouldn't, is kind of okay, it's kind of good. It gives people that choice then. But again, I don't think they really recommend it. So on your head be it, as well as the problem with removing the screen protector that Samsung have solved. They've also solved the problem of dust underneath the display. Now the first one was plagued with people getting dust and dirt under the display quite easily. With this, it has little tiny brushes in the hinge that sweep it out every time. And believe me, it needs it because every time this comes out of my pocket, for God knows what reason, the inside is always covered in lint and bits that have been in my pocket. It's quite disgusting, really. But the hinge is something quite special because it is much better than the original. Again, I haven't used the original, so I can't compare it completely, but I know that it couldn't really stay open like that. This one you can open at any sort of width and it will stay there at that width for you, which is extremely handy if you want to watch things like Netflix I want to stand it up rather than having to hold the phone like this. With a regular phone, obviously you can't stand it up. This, you can just leave it like that and watch Netflix on it. That is a handy feature. One last thing that I really like about the display is the little lip around the outside, which stops the two screens or two sides of the screen from touching each other. So there's a teeny, teeny, tiny little gap in between it, meaning that you're less likely to get scratched if there is a bit of dirt or dust or something on the inside of the screen. The only thing that I find a little bit odd about this is the fact there's nowhere obvious to open it. I think the sides are very, very smooth and sometimes it can be a little bit finicky to actually open it. There's no obvious textured area to hold or little indent for me to kind of get my fingers in. Instead, I end up quite often mashing the buttons on the side and using them as a form of lever to open it. So if Samsung were to make a third version of this, what I'd like is a tiny little bit of texture or something on the side to be able to kind of grip it and open it up. Because where I would naturally open it up is very smooth and doesn't feel quite right. But that's just something very, very small. Maybe I'm being a little bit nitpicky there, but it's an observation and feedback for Samsung. So that's with the phone open, but what about the phone closed? Well, let me talk to you about the front display. I've used the outside display maybe three times. No, I've used it a little bit more than that. But I would say that 95% of the time, I take it out of my pocket and I open it up to use it. And there is a number of reasons for that. Firstly, I'm not the sort of person to pick up a phone every five seconds and check the notifications and put it away. I don't really do it that much. Instead, I like to pick my phone up to be purposeful. I like to do things like reply to emails. I like to do things like post on Twitter and check the news, that sort of stuff. And generally speaking, when I pick my phone up, I'll spend about 10 or 15 minutes on it doing the work that I need to do before putting it away and then resuming later on. So really, this front screen is there for convenience, to be able to pick it up and quickly use it. But if I'm spending 10 or 15 minutes, why wouldn't I just open that and have a bigger display to do it on? 
don't really make sense to do it on the front screen. And also, I prefer the multitasking capability of the bigger screen as well. It's much easier to do things like have apps side by side and switch between them, rather than having to do it on a front screen. So why you'd want to use the front screen for any form of productivity style task that you might be doing, I don't know. The interesting thing here, though, is that if you do open it to do a task on the inside screen, it's not actually optimized as well as I would like. Let me show you this, for example. Let's say we're on Twitter and we're just checking the feed, see what people have been posting. And I open it so I can see it on a bigger screen. You can actually see less on the bigger screen than you could on the smaller screen. Look at them side by side and you'll see exactly what I mean. Yes, on the bigger screen, the photos and videos look nicer, they're bigger, but actually the amount of stuff on the screen is less because the app isn't optimized. I find that a little bit annoying. It's something that you might want to consider, but obviously that bigger screen does allow me to multitask. So I can go back to a form factor very similar to that on the front and have two apps side by side and go back to that long view that's on the front. But I don't want to do that. I like seeing things a little bit bigger, even if it does mean that I see less on the screen because I'm getting older, right? My eyesight needs bigger things. I'm starting to admit that. I make noises when I get out of the chairs, like, Ooh! things like that. I'm turning old. I've got gray in my beard somewhere. There's a few other optimization issues as well. For example, certain apps don't switch between the screens at all. Let's say we go into one app like this and we want to look at it on a big screen. We can open up the display, but it requires a restart of the app for it to switch between the form factor on the front to the form factor on the inside. Now, this is a bit annoying because it takes an extra couple of seconds for it to shut down the app and restart the app. Not a huge problem, but it is an optimization issue. And this is a bit of a problem when considering the Fold 2 because the optimization isn't necessarily down to Samsung. It's down to the individual app developers and whether or not they want to integrate screen switching in their apps. Going back to the fact that I've hardly used the front screen at all on the Fold 2, I think largely it's down to the unusual form factor. I mean, yeah, it's much better than the Fold 1 because that had like a kind of weird half display in it. It was very strange, and yet they still tried to push a full phone functionality out of that. This one actually is a semi-useful screen, but it is very, very, very tall very tall indeed and it's very hard even for me with massive long fingers to actually touch the top of the screen when you're holding the phone with one hand so it's a little bit useless in that respect i think if i was to add some sort of request to a bit of a wish list for the next generation of fold devices is that samsung doesn't necessarily need to make one with a screen on the front I'd be perfectly happy if Samsung made a device like the Surface Duo that was just a foldable device without a screen on the front. Maybe it could have a very, very small display that potentially just showed you notification icons. But if Samsung omitted a display from a version in the future and made it a little bit cheaper because it doesn't have it, and maybe even a little bit thinner as well because it doesn't have that front display, I wouldn't be losing any sleep. In fact, I'd probably prefer it, but that's just me. I know some people out there will absolutely love the front display. Just in my own experience, I've not found it that useful. However, and here is a big but, there has been one particular use that I found absolutely invaluable, and it's kind of made it worthwhile all this time, even though I haven't used it that much for anything else. And that is when you're taking photos. Now, if it didn't have a front screen, I'd have to open it up every time I wanted to take a photo. And that's not exactly useful because I don't really want to be standing there trying to take a photo like this. It's not very comfortable at all. Instead, it means that I can use the front display and take a photo as you would with a regular phone. But going one step further, the thing I love the most about the fact it has a front display is that I can use the rear cameras as a selfie camera. All I do is open the camera app, tap the selfie button at the very top. It tells me to open the display like this, and there you go.
That is cool, although it is a little bit awkward to actually try and take the photo by pressing some of the buttons because it is unfolded now. So pressing the buttons on the bottom or the top is a little bit awkward. Also pressing the button on the front to take the camera is a bit awkward because you end up getting a really unusual kind of shot of your arms if you're using wide angle. Don't really like that. So I found that I had to use the timer quite a lot, either two or five seconds, just to press it and let it set off by itself up there. But overall, that has been an invaluable feature about the fact it has a front display. Overall, the cameras have been fantastic, and I'll actually be doing a dedicated episode on the video and photo capabilities of the Fold 2 really, really soon. But to tease you, here's a couple of images just to give you an idea of the capabilities of the camera. If you wanna see this episode, don't forget to hit that subscribe and that notification bell, and you'll be notified as soon as this episode lands but as you can see some of the photos that this thing can take is beautiful and all of this is out of the native camera app with automatic controls too so far the battery life has been pretty decent as well i mean i've been using this like i said everywhere even out hiking all day taking photos and using it for navigation and not once have i needed to charge it more than once in the day and that really surprised me because using this big display you'd expect the battery to be draining really really quick but actually i found it more than enough for what i've needed it for it's just been a super surprise and i guess my expectations were quite low about the battery but i think that hits the nail on the head really this phone is a surprise. Every single day that I've used this device, I've found myself saying the same thing over and over again, either out loud or to myself in my head, and that is, wow, look at that. <sighs> look at that. Look at this. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. That's using that, Liz. Look at that. I thought that after a few days of use, the novelty of being able to open it up and use that folding display would have worn off a little bit. But it truly, truly hasn't. And it still wows me as I'm doing it right now. But there is one other big surprise that I need to talk to you about. And it's not a good surprise. Now hear me out here for a second. They call this color Mystic Bronze, right? And in here in the dark, it does look a bit bronzy and on the website against a black background, it indefinitely looks like a bronze-esque color phone. I'm starting to think I might be colorblind because when this thing arrived, it took me about 30 minutes to realize that the only mystic thing about this bronze is the fact that it's not bronze at all and it's actually pink. I mean, I've seen uncooked raw chickens that are more bronze than this phone. If you don't believe me, look at it in a different light. It's just super, super pink. It's not bronze at all. I'm not an anti-pink person when I'm choosing to buy a product that is pink for the purpose of it being pink. But when I'm choosing a product that's listed as bronze, looks relatively bronze on a website, arrives and it's pinker than pink. I mean, my friends think it's pink. My wife thinks it's pink. I now think it's pink. I don't know what you think. Let me know if you think that is pink. That rhymes a lot. But it's so different to what I thought it would look like that I've considered returning it and exchanging it for the black one with the gold hinge, which might I add, is a pretty sick customization option on the website because you can choose a color of the phone between pink and black and choose a hinge color. And I think the black and gold actually looks pretty cool. I guess the other surprise for some people is the price because there's no beating about the bush about this one. This phone is £1,799, which is a sickening amount. £1,800. That's just an unbelievable amount of money for a phone or a tablet, which this is sort of both. In fact, even a phone and a tablet you could buy for less than that. It's just a unholy amount of money. But what's even more disgusting is that you can buy a version called the Thumb Brown version, which costs $3,000 and looks like it has a pattern on the back that is made from electrical tape stuck to the back. I mean, 
do you pay more for the extra letters in Tom Brown's name? I mean, we all know that it should be just Tom Brown, but they've just added extra letters in to be fun. How about I do my own Stuart Thomas version and add a couple of extra letters in there as well, and maybe even charge £4,000 for the luxury of it all. Elegant, pure, strong. The Stuart Reviews Edition. Only £4,000 British pounds. Anyway, I jest. I know some of you out there are probably very fashionable and are raging that I'm saying this about Mr. Tom Brown, and I do apologise. I'm not fashionable in any way, shape or form. If you couldn't tell already, I'm about as fashionable as a brass monocle. Although they're pretty fashionable these days. They are coming back in. But forgetting about the Tom Brown model, the question is, is the Fold 2 worth the amount of money that Samsung are currently charging for it? And here is the truth about the Fold 2. In case you're wondering, this is 100% not CGI at all. And I absolutely didn't find it difficult to find somebody with a really old car like this one to borrow it for the weekend during this global pandemic. So I've borrowed this car and I've driven to the Swiss Alps to prove a point that I'm about to make about the Fold 2. Now the best way to think about this device is to compare it to some of the very first cars like this one that were ever made. Now these things were rare and being brand new technology they were a lot of money. They were the playthings of the rich and owned by some of the very first car enthusiasts. As a utility, they were at the forefront of technological convenience, and if you saw one driving past in a world of horse-drawn carriages, you'd have been astounded and in awe of what was happening. Well, that car is the Galaxy Fold 2. Yes, it's an expensive device, but the technology is completely new, so that's to be expected. And yes, only the very rich people or car enthusiasts will ever own a device at the price it's at, or in this case, tech enthusiasts. One thing is for certain though, every single person, whether they're an enthusiast or not, that lays hands or eyes on this device in real life is in utter awe of what this thing can do. And from my experience of this, it shows how good folding devices can be. And I believe that the Fold 2 has shown in a short space of time that like cars, these things will become commonplace in people's pockets in no time at all. What can I say? I am super excited to be holding this device because it feels like it's on the precipice of the next decade of mobile tech. I am now a complete and utter advocate of folding technology. I just think that is incredible. Whereas previously I was merely a peruser or an onlooker of this technology with a bit of skepticism, I'm now no longer a skeptic. And that concludes today's review. Guys, if you liked today's video, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe. And remember, hit that notification bell to find out when the camera review of this thing drops. And that'll be my last piece of content for a little while on the Samsung Fold. But other than that, guys, thanks very much for joining me here at Stu's Reviews. And I'll see you back for another episode of Stu's Reviews soon.